Good evening. Welcome to our Sunday evening service. Uh, open your Bibles, please, to the book of Exodus, chapter 17. Exodus, chapter 17, and verse, uh, verse 1 and verse 2. The first two verses, Exodus 17. The Bible says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses, and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? <coughs> and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. God, thank you for recording for us the events that took place with the Israelites as they left Egypt and marched towards the promised land. God, I pray that the they would be beneficial to us and that they would uh, help us and grow, uh, help us to grow. Uh, help me as I preach tonight. I pray that your Holy Spirit would give me the words that you would have spoken. And I might be a help and a blessing to your people. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. We were in Exodus 13 this morning. <coughs> um, I'm sorry, Exodus 14 this morning. Um, well, where, where were we? I was right the first time, Exodus 13. Uh, but uh, so we've gotten a little bit further with the Israelites here in, in the book of Exodus. Keep in mind they have left Egypt and uh, they are on their journey towards the promised land. And Egypt being a picture of the, the sinful world system and them leaving Egypt is a picture of salvation. And so they were in bondage to sin before and God delivered them. You'll never get out of the bondage of sin without God delivering you. And there's people say, well, I overcame this addiction, this, that, and the other. And I didn't turn to God at all during the whole time. Um, perhaps, but you're not out from bondage of sin. Um, <clears throat> you might be out from that particular sin, but you're still a servant to sin. And after they left Egypt, they crossed through the Red Sea. That's a picture of baptism, which takes place after somebody gets saved. And then they journeyed onto the promised land. And that journey is a picture of, of the Christian growing in Christ. Then they arrived at the promised land. And the promised land is not a picture of heaven. It's a picture of having grown to the point where you now have victory in your Christian life. Is it a, is it a sinless perfection? No, uh, but it is a, a point where you have learned uh, to trust in God and you've been through some things and you know some basics about your walk with God and Christianity or relationship with him. We see here in chapter 17, one of the many times where the Israelites uh, encountered problems along their journey. And so we're just going to zoom in on this a little bit. It says, And the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord. And so they are where they are, according to the, the record in the Bible here, because of the commandment of the Lord. And they've encountered problems along their journey. Now, <clears throat> it says uh, they, pitched their, or they pitched in Rephidim and there was no water for the people to drink. Now, this is not something that took God by surprise. God knew exactly the conditions of the terrain, the territory, that area, and he led them there anyways. And, and yet, uh, verse 2, it says, Wherefore the people did chide with Moses. Now, it's interesting here. Moses, God appointed Moses as their leader, but Moses didn't lead them there of his own accord. So Moses might have been walking out in front saying, come on, we're going this way. Um, but it wasn't because he chose that way. Moses had spent some time, some 40 years or so in this general area, taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. He knew where there was water and because he had had to lead the sheep from one place to another and, and find them water on a regular basis. And they arrived here at this location. There's no water there. And it wasn't because Moses had chosen to lead them there. Moses has led them there, but it is at the direction of God. In fact, if we go back to chapter 13 
and look at verse 20. We'll see a little something about that. It says, And they took their journey from Sukkoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them, <coughs> uh, to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So when, whenever they had to go somewhere, it wasn't that Moses said, hey, let's go up here, we'll turn left, and then we'll go a little while, we'll turn right, and you just follow me and we'll be okay. Um, and since he was leading them, he was out front, but in front of him was the pillar of cloud in the daytime. By night, it was a pillar of fire. They had to move during the nighttime. They had this great big pillar of fire up in the sky, and it would lead them. It would give them light. They could see where they were going, and they could see what direction they had to go. Just keep that pillar of fire in front of you. And by daytime, just keep that cloud. Just follow that cloud. Wherever it goes, that's where we're going. Moses would happen to be out front. And so in that sense, he's leading them, but really he himself is following that same cloud. And so in chapter 17, that cloud leads them to, uh, as they they journeyed from the wilderness of sin, they arrive at a place called Rephidim and it stops. And God said, pitch your tents. Here's where you're going to camp. And so they, they set up their their encampment, they set up their tents, they get their animals tucked away and, and corralled or, or contained somehow. And then the next order of business, okay, let's get some water. You start looking around. Some people go this direction, looking for water. Some people go out that way, and some people go out that way, and some people go the other way. And, and they, they spread out in many different directions, and they come back, and nobody has found water. And so they go to Moses, and they gang up on him. Now, let me, give, let me give just some observations about this, and uh, uh, then we'll wrap things up, and, and perhaps I'll give you back a little bit of time that I took this morning. Uh, first of all, Moses hadn't led them there, and we see that they are blaming Moses. They're blaming the man of God for where they're at. The fact of the matter is, God was the one that was in charge of that, that cloud and that pillar of fire. God was the one that was directing it. And so for them to arrive where they arrived, it was because God took them there. And God wanted them encamped in that area of Rephidim. <clears throat> and yet they blamed Moses. They said, there's no water here. And they, they started getting upset with them. In verse 3, it says, and the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses. He said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Now, first of all, Moses didn't bring them up out of the land of Egypt. God used him to lead them out. But it was God's mighty hand, as we saw in chapter 14 this morning, that uh, it was God's hand that brought them out of the land of Egypt. It was God's power. Those plagues were not given by Moses. God may have used him to... Uh, uh, to administer some of them, but Moses didn't come up with that. It wasn't Moses' power that uh, brought the plagues upon Egypt. It was God's hand that did it. And, and so some observations here. Moses had not led them there. God was the one that was in charge of directing that pillar of cloud and fire. And next observation is, and, and I'm just going to fast forward quite a bit, but they did arrive at the promised land. And they were following Moses. Moses following God, and Moses got them to the promised land. Now, it was actually God that did it, but by extension, he used Moses to do that. And the people, uh, <clears throat> the people that stuck with Moses arrived at the promised land. The people that said, we're not going to go, uh, we're, we're done here. We're not going to follow you anymore. Those people never arrived at the promised land. And so, the, uh, in fact, Moses got them to the promised land twice. And the first time, they sent spies in, and, you know, 12 men went to spy out Canaan. Ten were bad, and two were good. Ten came back with an evil report, and two came back and said, let's go get it. Uh, God has promised it to us, and, and it's ours for the taking with, with the help of God. And, and they voted, and they refused to go in. Now, Moses led them right there to the border, right there, and said, just across that line is where God 
has, has promised for us to be able to live and for him to be our God and us to be his people and for us to have the blessings of God upon our lives, our children's lives, and generation after generation after gener generation. But they chose not to go in. They chose. They elected to not go in. And so God said, all right, turn around. And he moved that pillar and took them back into the wilderness. And it, it stayed with them. Forty years later, Moses brought them back again to the border of the promised land. Now, during those 40 years, Moses had blown it. He lost his temper and he forfeited his opportunity to go into the promised land. But he, he was taken up on the mountainside by God to where he could see and look into the promised land. God said, you're not going to be able to go in, but I'll let you take a look at it. And then God took him home from there. And the Bible tells us that God buried him there. And, and so <clears throat> there's, there's just, I, I want to boil this down to two things that that generation did. And one big failure and one big victory. And their big failure was their refusal to go into the promised land. They, they, they murmured, they complained about Moses, and Moses is leading us, and he's, it's your fault that we're thirsty, it's your fault that we're not in Egypt anymore. And again and again throughout the book of Exodus, you find them saying, it's your fault that we're hungry, it's your fault that we're having to see uh, these, these snakes out here, and it's, it's everything bad that happened to them, they blamed on the man of God. And that's not an uncommon thing. That's something that preachers that preach the word of God see all over the world. They'll be, they're pastoring a church and people are following their leadership as they follow God. And understand this, you are going to face problems along the journey. You're going to encounter problems. You're going to find yourself in situations where you have done what the pastor opened up the Bible and said you should do. And you're going to find you're going to find yourself in a problem because you did right. Because you did what God wanted you to do. You're going to find yourself in a place, in a situation that you may find uh, uncomfortable, that you may find uh, uh, painful even. And the people here, they are thirsting. And I, I imagine, I've never done it before, but I imagine if you walk through the desert for a while, you're going to get thirsty. And that's exactly what happened to them. They're going through this wilderness Hot by day, 140 degrees by day, and, and uh, sometimes as cold as 40 degrees at night. You talk about a, a, a shift in temperature, a 100 degree difference between the low at night and the high the next day, and then the low again the following night. And sometimes that, you know, uh, not every night necessarily that extreme, but at times it was that. And, and you're going to get thirsty. And that's exactly what happened to these people. And they blamed Moses. It's your fault that I'm having problems. I'll tell you, the people that were in the wilderness that were not following Moses, they got thirsty too. But they didn't find themselves at this specific location. It was the people that were there because they were following Moses as he followed the pillar, as he followed the cloud uh, and the fire. And it was God's leading. And understand, God sometimes will lead you to a point where you are facing problems, where you are going through discomfort, you might, you're going through a heartache, you're going through a difficulty, you're going through a challenge, you're going through a, a place where you are in need and the solution to that need is nowhere in sight. And you say, it's God's fault that I'm here. And I, I wouldn't, it's God's doing that you're there, but it is not a fault of God that you are there. I would encourage you, stay with the leading of God. And even through the Apostle Paul, God told the people, as, as the voice of Paul, follow me, you know, be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. Paul said, sure, follow me. I'm your preacher. I'm the man of God in your life. You follow me, but only as I'm following Christ. And Moses, you know, he said, come on, let's go. We're leaving Egypt. You follow me as I follow that pillar of cloud. And if Moses ever got off track and went off some other direction, the people could still follow the pillar. They could still follow that, the, the cloud by day and that pillar of fire by night. 
and they could still follow God. And, and that's exactly what they were doing. That just so happened, Moses stayed in line the whole time. And <clears throat> yet they blamed him. And so often people end up in their Christianity. They've left the world and they get in church and they get baptized and they begin their journey in their lives as Christians and heading towards the promised land. And they find themselves in a problem, in a situation that they've never faced before. They say, it's the preacher's fault that I'm here. It's God's fault that I'm here. It's, it's God's fault that I have this need, that I have this, this uh, situation in my life that, that I can't handle myself. Let me encourage you that as that pastor stays with the word of God, and I'm not asking for blind loyalty to a preacher. I'm not asking for people to just uh, cover their eyes and their ears and their mouth and just shut up and get in line and follow the pastor and do whatever he says. Do. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying if he opens the Bible and the Bible says to do this, you need to do that. You need to follow that leadership. And the Bible tells us that the, the, one of the pastor's jobs, one of the things that he's doing is he's watching for your soul. He's serving as a guard for your soul. And some people think he's just watching you all the time. He, he doesn't have time for that. I've been accused of looking in people's windows and listening in at their doors and, and, and uh, doing everything but reading their mail so I know what to preach about. I don't need to do that. God already knows what you're involved in. And all I have to do is get in the Bible and pray and ask God to, to give me something to preach, and he does. And if it happens to, to sound like it's ringing your doorbell, you take that up with God. But I know our tendency as humans is to blame the man of God. And so I want to say those that stuck with Moses arrived at the promised land. Now they made a mistake and their big failure was they chose not to go in. They chose not to go in. And so they had to do an about face and head back. And over the next 40 years, and here was, here was their victory. Over the next 40 years, they did follow Moses. And Moses said, we're going this way. And they went that way. And God said, Moses, now take him over here. And Moses said, we're going over there. And they went that way. Now, granted, that cloud and that fire, it was still there. It did not go away as long as they were traveling through that wilderness. And, and by the way, God's word will never go away. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But God's words are not ever going to be destroyed. And so it's my job to stand up here, open the Bible and say, we're going this way. And you see it in the Bible and say, all right, we're going that way. And so for the next 40 years, they followed the leadership of Moses. They would bring their situations, their problems, uh, their needs to him. And Moses would go to God and he would get the answer, the solution to what they were going through, what they were facing. And he would give it back to them. And, and for the next 40 years, what they were doing was, in the victory that they had was they at least taught their children, you stick with the man of God and you follow the man of God in your life. And so 40 years later, they arrived back at the borders of the promised land. Once again, they send spies out and they come back. God has taken Moses up on the mountainside to where he can see out over the promised land. And there God buries him and takes him home. And he passes the torch to Joshua. And now Joshua is the man of God for the Israelites. And Joshua says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to cross this river. We're going to go over. We're going to get to the city of Jericho. And God's going to give us Jericho. And we're going to march around Jericho. And this is exactly how we're going to do it. This is how many days we're going to do it. This is how many times we're going to do it each day. This is what we're going to do on the final day. And for 40 years, those people had seen their parents go to the man of God, ask, what do we do now? And a lot of times it seemed like they were complaining to the man of God and they were, they were murmuring and they were grumbling and mumbling and moaning and, and and whining and just carrying on. But at least they said when, when mom and dad had a problem, they went to the man of God and their problem was solved. God gave that man the solution to help mom and dad. And so they said, we're going to stick with. And, and Joshua stood up and he, he gave them a challenge when God gave him that position. He said, now you need to choose 
this day whom you're going to serve. If you're going to serve the gods of Egypt and go on back there and serve those gods. But if you're going to go this way, he said, as for me and my house, here's what we're doing. We will serve the Lord. And they said, we're with you. The way mom and dad were with Moses in the wilderness, we're with you. And they followed him right across that river. And they followed him around Jericho and around Jericho and around Jericho. All the times that he led them, they went around. On that final time, that uh, trip around, they stopped. They blew the trumpets. They shouted. And God brought the walls down and gave them the victory. Now, there was one man who said, I'm not going to follow the instructions. And it cost him his life and the lives of his family as well. It cost others their lives on the next, the next city where they had to battle. But the victory is they at least taught their children to follow the man of God. I would encourage you not to blame some person because of where you find yourself. And if you've been following God's word and you find yourself in a difficult situation, I would encourage you to look to God. To look to God because you are there for a reason. It is his purpose and his reason. Ask him for the help. And, and so they get there and <clears throat> uh, let's, let's read on and see exactly what happened here in 17. Verse 4, And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee uh, of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Oreb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And the Bible teaches us he, he did strike the rock there and water flowed out and there was enough for all the people. There was enough for all the people's children. There was enough for all of their animals, their livestock and everything else that needed water. They had more than enough. That rock is still there. And it's split right open, and there's erosion marks from the inside out on that rock. Just as it said in the Bible. So we have, well, how did that work out for them? Well, even though they were maybe not doing it with a good attitude, they did take their problem to the man of God. The man of God took that problem to God, got the solution from God, brought the solution back to them, and their needs were fulfilled. The wonderful thing is, as Christians, we all have that direct access to God, and yet God still puts a man in our lives to help us. God has still put a man of God in our lives. That's why God wants us in church. That's why God gives us, he says he gave us pastors and evangelists <clears throat> and teachers and preachers. Why? Because God knew we would need that. God knew we would need that. It's up to us to choose if we're going to go ahead and go in and, and live the life of victory as Christians. It's a choice. Moses couldn't force them to go in. What they did accomplish, though, was teaching their kids, you go in, you follow, you stick with God and his man, and just keep going forward. Let's stand tonight and we'll close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, the examples that are recorded for us. We pray that uh, you'd help us to learn from them and uh, to learn what to do. And Lord, help us to apply that in our lives. May we learn what not to do and, and make sure to avoid that by your help, your leading, and your guidance. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.